Okay, so this is the uh, last and important module on uh, field effect transistors. Okay, so since since there were questions about this, let's first convince you why this is the most important device you'll study in this class. You saw this uh, slide. <coughs> uh, you saw this slide earlier in the in the module. This is Moore's law. Right, this is showing the number of uh, transistors that are in a microprocessor. When we're talking about the number of transistors, we are talking about MOSFETs, field effect transistors. Uh, and the, the field effect transistor is important because it is the basic building block of a microprocessor. Each one of, you know, each one of your microprocessors today have well beyond, you know, they could have hundreds of millions or more than a billion uh, transistors um, on one of those chips. And because there's so many transistors, it's, that's what's, what allows it to do complex computation. Right? It is the, the, by far the most common semiconductor component, uh, semiconductor device that's used. Uh, back in the 1970s, like the, the, this was one of the first microprocessors that, that Intel released. It had about 2,300 transistors on it. And those transistors were slow by today's standards. Uh, the clock speed of them, meaning the speed at which they could be turned on and off, uh, was around 108 kilohertz, and uh, they had the amount of memory was really quite small, and they were about 10 micrometers in size. So 10 micrometers in size is still pretty small because um, if you if you were to take the average human hair and look at the diameter of it, the thickness of the hair is usually about around 100 micrometers. So if you take one tenth the diameter of your hair, that's how big one of the field effect transistors were back in the 70s. Nowadays, um, you know, back in 2000, it was about 0.18 microns, about, I would say, what, 200 times, um, let's see, one micron, about 500 times smaller than what they were in the 70s. And nowadays, they're, you know, some of the newest processes, that the size of the transistors are about 14 to 20 nanometers. So another, um, another factor of 10 smaller than what they were in the 2000s. So because of that, we're able to fit, you know, by making the transistors, transistors very small, we're able to cram more and more transistors on a chip. The size of the chip hasn't really changed that much. It's about, you know, about this big. You know, they go into your phones, they go into your computer um, chips, or they go into your comp uh, PCs and so on. <coughs> but the fact is we can cram more and more transistors into a small area and the more transistors you can have, the more complex computation you can do. Now, um, just to connect this to the stuff you're learning in your other classes, uh, oh, I think I actually have a slide on this, so let's not bother with that. Yeah, I'm skipping ahead here, but uh, this is the um, the motivation for this. You know, it, how many of you have taken digital circuits and switching circuits, logic circuits? So you remember you learned about logic gates, AND gates, OR gates, inverters, and um, you know, in a, in a more advanced course, you'd actually learn how these logic gates can be put together to form computer architecture components, like you know, how to form arithmetic logic units where all the calculations in the microprocessor is done. Um, how to, you know, there are variants of these devices which can actually be used to store memory. Um, all the processing that happens in a computer chip are basically coming from logic gates, and these logic gates are made up of transistors. They're made up of uh, field effect transistors, two types primarily. There's a, a PMOS device and an NMOS device. This is an example of an inverter, and there's an input to the inverter, and this goes to two it's connected to the gates of two, two transistors, a PMOS device and an NMOS device. Uh, they're connected together in this fashion. The drains are connected together. The source of the PMOS is connected to the uh, VDD, the supply voltage. And then the source of the NMOS is connected to ground. And if you put in a high voltage at the input, you'll get a low voltage at the output. If you put in a low voltage at the input, you'll get a high voltage at the output. It's an inverter. And um, you know different logic gates can be implemented by different combinations of transistors. Now in this class, we actually look at how to what the structure of these transistors look like, how to an analyze them from an energy band diagram uh, standpoint. So 
the stuff that you've le been learning in your other classes is it's complementary to what you're learning in this course. You're learning how these things are physically laid out and what they physically look like on a wafer. This is important because uh, the ability to make these transistors very small and cram them very close to one another is basically what has led to you know, just how powerful computers are these days. So this, the outline that we're going to follow, <coughs> we'll talk about the structure of the MOSFET, we'll talk about the IV characteristics in cutoff, triode, and saturation. Those are the three regions that a MOSFET can work in. Uh, we'll talk about the physical models and energy band models of the MOSFET. Um, there, you know, in addition to cutoff, triode, and saturation, there's also the equilibrium, accumulation, depletion, inversion modes. So we'll talk about uh, all these different um, modes of operation for the MOSFET. And then we'll also get into transient characteristics if we, if we have time. So these are the two types of MOSFETs that you've talked about in your, in your other courses. There's an NMOS device and a PMOS device, and the typical operation is as follows. Uh, there's a gate voltage that's applied to the gate and source terminals. In order for current to flow, the gate voltage must exceed the threshold voltage of the transistor. Um, and there's also a drain voltage. The drain voltage is applied across the drain and the source terminals. As a result of applying the gate and drain voltage, a current ID flows between the source and the drain terminals. What a MOSFET is, you know, uh, a MOSFET is, you can think about it as a relay. Have, have any of you worked with relays? You know, since maybe you're in the automotive industry. What, what does a relay do? Switch. It's a switch, right? It's a switch. Uh, it, uh, and specifically, how does that switch work? Uh, electromagnetic relays. Uh, you use like a small current to control a larger current. Exactly. Small current to control a large current or small voltage to control a current. It's um, an, A relay is an electronically controlled switch. And at the essence, that is what a transistor is. Now, um, I'm going to draw this out in a schematic form. So if we look at the mechanical, me mechanical switch on the wall, right? The switch goes, um, you can switch it mechanically into one position or the other. So a mechanical switch looks something like this. And this, and when you put the switch in the on position, now you have a short circuit. So move the switch to the on off position, you have an open circuit. This is open. This is short. Now, in a mechanical switch, obviously you have to mechanically move it, right? Anything with moving parts in it is inherently slow, um, and uh, uh, it's relatively low speed. Now, the reason we're talking about switches is because the basic building block, a transistor is basically a switch. You need switches. A computer is basically made up of transistors. A transistor is basically a switch. So that's why we're talking about switches right now. This is a mechanical switch. Mechanical switch. Now, um, a relay, uh, a relay might look something like this, where you have a solenoid. Well, let, let's 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 not draw the relays in there to, to make things confusing. Um, let's, just, let's just talk about the relays, okay? A relay is a uh, um, elect electronically controlled switch. When you put a voltage on the relay, it moves a solenoid from one place to another, and that solenoid completes the circuit for you. Okay, so instead of a mechanical switch, you have an electronically controlled switch. The relay still has moving parts in it, right? So the, the relay, uh, it's, it's, it's relatively slow. In principle, you could make a computer out of a bunch of relays, but it would consume immense amounts of power, <laughs> and it would be, it would be completely um, impractical. So an electronic switch, in other words, a transistor, and TX is kind of a, TX can sometimes means transmission, it can also mean a transistor. Uh, a transistor looks something like this. I want you to see the analogy. So when the switch is open, so let's say for an NMOS device, uh, the gate voltage is equal to zero. There's no current. When the gate voltage is zero, this transistor is off. There's no current flow between the, the drain and the source. Okay? Now, when you, put, when you turn it on, you're putting the gate, 
the gate the voltage is greater than the threshold voltage. We'll figure out we'll find out what the threshold voltage is later. And now when you turn the device on, now you do allow current flow between the drain and the source. So you can think about the that the um, this is a transistor is an electronically controlled switch that makes the electrical connection between the drain and the source. But it does it instead of being a mechanical switch, it's it's a voltage controlled switch. Right? And the transistor can, you know, it can switch on and off in, in a matter of picoseconds, as opposed to like hundreds of milliseconds as would be required in a solenoid or a mechanical switch. Picoseconds is 10 to the negative 12. 10 to the negative 12 compared to 10 to the negative 1. It's much, much faster, much, much lower power. And because we have these manufacturing processes, we can create a whole bunch of switches. We can create massive circuits made up of billions of switches. That's what allows us to do computation. Now, <clears throat> of the two types of transistors, hopefully you've learned, learned about these in electronics. One, um, there's an NMOS device. And the NMOS device turns on when you put a high gate voltage here a positive gate voltage between the gate and the source. The device turns on and then allows current flow between the drain and the source. The PMOS device is the opposite. You, at, you apply a negative gate voltage with respect to the source. That's why the diagram is sort of like this. The, the source is placed higher, it's placed at the top here, because it, it's at a higher voltage. So instead of applying a VGS to turn the device on, you apply a VSG. That turns the device on and the, the current then is allowed to flow between the source and the drain. So the gate to source voltage is what turns the device on and that basically completes, you know, it opens up a connection between the drain and the source and then current can flow uh, between the drain and the source when you apply uh, uh, a voltage at the source to drain. All right, so to get current to flow between the source and the drain, there's two things you have to do. You have to apply a certain gate voltage to turn the device on, and then you also have to apply a voltage between the drain and the source in order to actually get current flow. You know, so in other words, going back to this diagram, you know, when you turn the device on, you know, this this has a little resistance associated with it. So in order to get current to flow, of course, you still have to apply a voltage between the drain and the source if you want current flow. Okay. The main concept is this, that by applying a gate voltage you can turn the device on or off. You can open or close the circuit. These are the MOSFET IV characteristics. We'll talk more about these as we go. We're just going to gloss over them a little bit right now. There's a triode region this is when you apply a small drain voltage. The, uh, the characteristic here, as you can see, is sort of linear on, up until we get to this point here. Initially, it's linear. So when you turn the device on, when you, turn, uh, when you apply a certain gate voltage to turn the device on, this looks like a resistor. The connection between the source and drain looks like a resistor. So there is an, a linear characteristic between the drain voltage and the drain current. So this is very much like a resistor. However, if you apply large voltages to the drain, uh, if you apply large VDS, then eventually the, um, the current is going to saturate, meaning it gets to some value and then it can't go any higher than that. The current at which it saturates depends on what the gate voltage is. So in the intuitive way of describing that is if, if you put a small gate voltage on there, you sort of turn the device on. And so you'll be able to put through a maximum, you'll be able to put this much amount of current through there, just a little bit. If you put a larger gate voltage, you basically turn the device on even more. So you end up getting a, a more, you know, there's more current that can flow between the source and the drain. That's the way I like to think about it. So this, the saturation current uh, increases the larger, the more, uh, um, <clears throat> the more gate voltage you have. In other words, the more you turn the device on. And so the IV characteristics look uh, look very much um, like a, you know a line, and then that line uh, kind of starts curving off, and then it forms a horizontal line here like this. So all these blue lines are at different values of gate voltage. Uh, does this stuff look familiar to some of you from Electronics One? 
Okay. All right, good. And we'll come back to this, so don't worry about that. Uh, I want to get into some of the intuition of the MOSFET today so that we can come back to it the next time. There's two areas where MOSFETs are, um, are really, you know, they've really made an uh, impact in our society. The first one I've been uh, hammering on in the last few minutes, it's about digital switching. The transistor is an electronically controlled switch. It's controlled by the gate voltage. Switches are the basic building blocks of logic gates. Logic gates are the build basic building blocks of microprocessors. So this is a, a, a Xeon processor that has 1 billion uh, transistors on it. There are um, you know, even more advanced microprocessors today that have even more. The more transistors you have, the uh, more complex computation you can do. You know, nowadays, Intel has their multi-core processors. Uh, so they actually have multiple computational units that work in parallel because they, they're able to, the transistors are nowadays are so small that you can actually cram, you can actually create a whole microprocessor core here and right next to it put another microprocessor core on there. So they have like, in some of the cases they have up to eight processor cores, I think. And in supercomputers they have even more than that, I think. It's, it's, it's quite amazing. <clears throat> what, what boggles my mind is how they're able to manufacture all those transistors and all those transistors are, you know, they work as expected. So the, the fabrication processes are really quite amazing. You know, you saw the other day in the lab that, um, you know, if you just put a, a wafer in a furnace, you'll get different resistances on one side of the wafer versus the other. Right? But in commercial fabs, they have all these processes so well controlled that the properties are uniform throughout the, throughout the wafer. Okay, the next application of MOSFETs is in amplification. So MOSFETs are used to amplify analog signals. Uh, it used to be, you know, uh, back in the 80s, you know, when I grew up, <laughs> they, you know, you see the big boombox radios, right? <laughs> and those were small compared to some of the radios that they had um, before that. Um, one of the reasons why radios used to be large, um, you know, several decades earlier is because they required and these amplifiers, right? amplifiers to amplify a small, a very small radio signal. A tiny radio signal needs to be amplified into something that can drive your speaker. So amplifiers require um, uh, these components, like these, you know, the, some of the amplifier circuits that you guys have learned in Electronics One. You know, the common source amplifier, the common emitter amplifier. Okay, those types of amplifiers used to be made out of um, uh, vacuum tubes. And vacuum tubes are these like devices that are about this big that can that can serve as um, uh, do the same function as a transistor. And in fact, in some cases, those things are still used today uh, for amplification. Some of the you know hardcore audiophile people like they prefer to use those things compared to the transistors. But once the transistors came around, you could build start building these amplifier circuits, like the common emitter circuits, the common gate, the common source circuits push-pull stages. So you can build these amplifiers and those amplifiers are extremely tiny because the transistors themselves are extremely tiny. So this allowed you to shrink a radio from something that was like this big to, you know, something that, you know, transistor radios were about this big. And now, you, if you look in your cell phones, you have many amplifier components in your cell phones to communicate with the cell phone towers. All those amplification circuits are made from CMOS now. They used to be made from uh, gallium arsenide components, but um, more recently there's a, just in the last 10 or 15 years, all these wireless components including Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and uh, uh, cellular, they're all done on CMOS right now, um, CMOS transistors, and uh, that has really driven down the cost to the point where we have wireless in pretty much everything. So uh, uh, that's the other big use of uh, MOSFETs, and really this comes down to the two most important um, reasons why electronics are important in our lives. Number one, computation, right? Your microprocessors, things in your phones, and uh, amplification, wireless communication. You know, you have the two biggest things about the electronics field that are enabled by transistors. So, um, what I want to get into is uh, just how um, a MOSFET controls current. Oops. So I want to I want you to understand this from sort of a like a very conceptual uh, standpoint. Is it how how a MOSFET, you know, where the idea of a MOSFET may come from? 
So you want something, this is the gate, and this is the source, and this is the drain. We want to be able to control whether there's a connection between the source and the drain, and by basically by controlling a voltage here. <clears throat> All right, so the, the gate will control whether there's an electrical connection between the source and the drain. So how do we do that? So the source gate and drainer here. Let's look at how we can do that using semiconductors. And this is, in principle, how a MOSFET works. Uh, the transistor can be in two states, in the cutoff region, and it can be in the, in the inversion state. In the cutoff state, let's say we have a source and we have a drain. This is an NMOS device, by the way. The source and the drain are N-type. The gate, uh, when it's in the cutoff region, is just a P-type semiconductor. Now, this is what uh, this is what the uh, 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 what it would look like in terms of a circuit. The N-type semiconductor, as you know, it has some sort of resistance associated with it. We have a P-N junction here, so this is a diode. So the diode is in this direction. The P-type semiconductor itself is a resistor. And uh, there's another diode here because there's a PN junction here, another resistor here. So this is what the circuit looks like. So if you were to connect a voltage between the source and the drain here, you wouldn't get any current. And the reason why is because you have two back-to-back -back diodes. Diodes pointed in the opposite direction. So regardless of what kind of voltage you put on the system, there's always going to be one of the diodes is going <coughs> to be reverse bias. And reverse bias diodes don't conduct current, right? They're essentially off. They only allow current flow in one direction. So this is what a, a, a MOSFET looks like, a field effect transistor looks like, an NMOS device looks like in the cutoff region. Now, um, what it looks like in the uh, on, you know, when it's in the on mode, we can switch that P-type material to an N-type material. Now, this is the magic of how a MOSFET works. Right now, you guys have learned that you can switch a P-type material to an N-type material using a few different mechanisms. What, what are the ways we can do that? Doping, Doping right. <laughs> yeah, there's essentially one way, right? If you want to switch a P-type material to an N-type material, you, you dope it, right? So uh, that obviously takes a long time, and you need a microfabrication facility to do that. So that's not practical, right? The field effect transistor, the interesting thing about it is that it, it is able to switch a P-type material to an N-type material very rapidly just by applying an electric field to it. By applying a voltage, you can switch that P-type material in the middle to an N-type. And that essentially turns the device on. If, this is, if you have three back-to-back N-type materials, now you don't have these diodes anymore. You just basically just have three resistors. And so now current can flow between the source and the drain. So from a, from a device standpoint, from a physics standpoint, the interesting thing in a field effect transistor, the, the reason why it's called a field effect transistor is because through the electric field, by applying a field, field effect, through the field effect, you're switching the, uh, um, the channel regions. The channel region is the region right under the gate. You're switching that from one type of semiconductor to the other type of semiconductor so that you can conduct current between the source and the drain. That's the basic idea behind a MOSFET. So the next question you're obviously asking is like how, how could a, a, a voltage switch a material from a P-type to an N-type? And so that's what we're going to talk about more um, in the next class period. We're just going to, in the next five minutes, we'll just give you the basic idea here. And um, this is the structure and, of, and the physical model of an NMOS device. Okay, This is the source region here. This is the drain region here. And it, there's a P-type substrate here. So your channel region, what I was just drawing on the previous slide, is this region here, the region underneath the gate. Now the gate itself is, the gate consists of a thin insulating layer with a metal on top. So this green region here, here is an insulator and the metal is on top of it. And the orange region is a metal. In the off state, there's no electrical connection between the source and the drain um, because you have an N 
type, and then a p-type material in the middle here, and an n-type. So there's going to be no electrical connection between the source and the drain now. By applying a voltage to the gate, we can actually switch this p-type material in the channel and switch it to n-type. And that's called inversion. It's called inversion because we are, uh, we're switching it from p-type to an n-type. We're inverting the material from one, one type to another. So this is how inversion works. Um, when you apply a gate voltage, a positive gate voltage, to, um, this is what happens. You build a positive charge on the gate. Now think about this. I want you to think about this. What will happen? What do you think will happen if we um, apply a, a positive charge on the gate? So this electric field thing. Why does that happen? That will repel the holes, exactly. But why does that electric field happen to begin with? Remember that whenever you have positive charge, okay, back to you know the basic physical concept of a capacitor. A MOSFET is actually very much like a capacitor. Um, you, you have a voltage here, and you put it across two metal regions with a dielectric in the middle. You build a positive charge on one end and negative charge on the other end, and the electric field points this way. Now, what would happen if you were to take a positive charge in this electric field? Which way would it go? Towards the negative, right? That's what we call drift current. Now, what's happening here, you're, by putting a positive voltage on the gate, um, you can think about your source is then connected to the substrate, okay? Because most of the time, the source is indeed connected to the substrate. So, your positive, the positive side of the capacitor is here. The negative side of the capacitor is the substrate. The electric field points from top to bottom. Uh, as, as Michael said, that if you have an electric field here, that's going to drive away the holes. So within the piece type substrate, two things happen. First, the holes in the substrate get driven away. What's the other thing that happens? What will happen to the electrons? they get pulled in, right? So the majority holes are getting pushed away, the minority electrons are getting pulled in there, and it turns out the minority electrons form a, um, a negatively charged layer just under here. So if you take a p-type material, you take away all the holes and you just keep the electrons, you've basically switched it to an n-type material, right? So this is the intuition behind the, the concept of inversion. So these electrons that get pulled in here form, uh, you know, form basically an n-type material. An n-type material is a, is a semiconductor material that has a high concentration of electrons and a low concentration of holes. That's a definition. We start off with a p-type material. We drove all the holes away. We reduce the hole concentration and we increase the electron concentration. So we've effectively switched it to an n-type material. Um, this is the inversion channel. Now we have an n-type source, n-type drain, and an n-type channel connecting the two of them. So now you can get uh, electricity conduction between the drain and the source. This is how inversion works. Now this, if you compare this to a mechanical switch, right, this effect, the formation, if you apply gate voltage, the channel forms within like nanoseconds, picoseconds. It depends on, it depends on how big the, the transistor is. But Nanoseconds, picoseconds, 10 to the negative 9, 10 to the negative 12, even in some cases, even slow, faster than that. These are extremely, you're, you're able to switch on and off your switch at a very, very rapid rate. And this is why transistors can be clocked at rates of like 3 gigahertz. So you have a very, very fast switch that, that's controlled purely electronically. Right? This is the main idea behind uh, transistor. So we'll end class here today. We're going to come back to this on Thursday. We'll talk more about inversion, the triad region, saturation, and we'll start getting into deriving the equations. If you didn't bring in your lab reports today, please remember to bring them on, on Thursday.